Good evening, all. Welcome to the first workshop of Pandora Unboxing Crimson Hope by Women's Health Team of SAF with organizing partners, Clinicis Ascents, and promotional partners, Red Rack Club of Caduceus, and Medicopolitan Magazine. Thank you for taking time to join us today. This session is scheduled to begin at 5 p.m. IST, which is also 11.30 a.m. GMT. A feedback, a feedback form link will be sent towards the end of the session on the Zoom chat. Uh, after filling, uh, you'll have to fill that to be eligible to get the certificate of participation. Please note that this session will be recorded to, for archive purposes and posted onto our YouTube channels. Please bear with us as we short restart. Amitika, I'll hand over the session to you as uh, you'll be the moderator. Hi, good evening to one and all present here. I'm Avantika Singh, the co-lead of Women's Health Team of Students Against COVID. I welcome you all to the workshops by Love Matters on the topic, Understanding the Triangle Approach of Sexual Health, Sexual Rights and Sexual Pleasure, conducting under the series Pandora, Unboxing the Crimson Hope with our organizing partners, Clinic Ace. So firstly, I'll just introduce what is Love Matters. And then I'll just introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, we have uh, Love Matters was found by uh, Vitika Yadav. She's the co-founder of Love Matters India, which is the first ever and most popular digital initiative in India to give complete, honest, and non-judgmental information on sexual and reproductive health and rights to young people in India in both Hindi and English language. In 2013, Love Matters won the award for excellence and innovation in sexuality education from the World Association for Sexual Health. From Love Matters, we have none other than the founder of Love Matters, uh, Vitika Yadav, as the speaker. She's an, I'll just provide an intro, ma'am, about you. So, Vitika Yadav, uh, uh, she is an anti-slavery, a sexual rights and gender rights activist and a social entrepreneur with over 18 years of experience. In 2016, she received the honor of being one of the top 120 under 40 new generation of family planning leaders in the world, an initiative by Bill and Melinda Gates, Institution for Population and Reproductive Health. She has also been featured in the award-winning documentary, Hashtag Female Pleasure. She is also the chair of the Global Advisory Board on Sexual Health and Wellbeing. Welcome to you, ma'am, in this e event, and thank you for joining us at such a short notice. Thank you. Thank you, Avantika. Um, that was a very, very warm welcome. Thank you so much. Yeah, ma'am, I hand it over to you to start the workshop. Thank you, Avantika. First and foremost, I would like to thank uh, SAC and Clinic Essen to, you know, sort of uh, having me here. I love doing these workshops with young people and especially medical students, which we have been doing, which I have personally been doing for the past um, three or four years now. Um, and, and it's really interesting how, uh, you know, I mean, we often talk about the problems when it comes to a medical system, you know, but we, we do not try to sort of dig enough to really see what is the foundational problem, and especially when we're talking about sexual health, and I think sexual pleasure, no matter what stream, you know, you can be a doctor, you cannot be a doctor, you can be a healthcare professional, you can be an engineer, you can be whosoever, but sex is such an integral part of our lives that we ought to understand, uh, one, not feel ashamed uh, when talking about sex and sexuality, and second, um, you know, just, just really create an environment, we're really able to understand uh, what constitutes good health and well-being, right? Good health and well-being is not just about good nutrition. Of course, it is very, very important. Good health and well-being is not just about, you know, sort of really focusing on your sports or what you're going to eat and, you know, how you look, your all of those things. But a good health and well-being is also very important in context of how, how you know, what we think about ourselves, our bodies, how we engage with our own selves, um, our body image, positive body image, and how we look at look at sexuality and sexual health, how we own who we are, you know? So all of these aspects, of course, are very tricky, you know, when we kind of throw around these words and say that, of course, what does pleasure really mean? And 
and frankly you know i mean i have to start on the note that sexual pleasure was considered a very very controversial terminology and extremely frivolous 10 years back when i started love matters in india you know something that was controversial in in the landscape of sexual reproductive health with beat organizations uh, beat healthcare professionals beat frontline workers there was a lot of judgment around what is this woman wanting to say and do right and on the other hand we were trying very very hard and finding it extremely challenging to engage with young people especially on you know really understanding and assessing their needs in context of sexual and reproductive health also acknowledging that they have a right to information and access information which is friendly which is not really judging them for what they know and what they do not know uh, but also sort of creating a safe space where they be where we could really engage with young people and say that you know all your questions whatever kind of questions you are these are all normal questions what you feel is normal and we need to have a uh, open and honest discussions about these questions so that's really where the sort of the journey started yes we started in india and we actually do have a global presence um much like you know uh, the network that you all are a part of we have a presence in china latin america egypt and africa so love matters is essentially world's leading uh, digital portfolio on sexual reproductive health and rights of young people um and and it's been a long journey one that has been full of learnings where we are learning every single day uh and in my role I and mean, of course what i'm going to present today is also something that is a part of uh, my role as chair at the global advisory board for sexual health and well-being where we have experts from different regions and different parts of the world where the where the work that we do together is really you know um engaging in thought leadership when it comes to the triangle approach of sexual health rights and pleasure and really talk about the missing link which is sexual pleasure and uh, how to really in, you know integrate sexual pleasure in the ongoing programs and what does that really mean right how to unpack it so that's that's really the background i wanted to start um uh with uh, with a little you know sort of um, i would say quick uh, question that i wanted to ask all of you so i'm going to post the mentimeter link on the chat and i would like you all to please respond to that question is that okay yes ma'am okay i'll just post the question so you have the link and you also have the voting code and um, i would i would request you all to please start answering that keep them coming Once you're done with this question you can move to the next question
can you all also see the second question? Oh, ma'am, the second question isn't visible yet. It isn't? Let me post the link for that one as well. Just one second. Let me know if this one works. I can't see the responses to the second question. Yeah, ma'am. The, uh, the link was for the first question only. The second question is still showing that please wait for the presenter to show the next slide. Um, that's weird. Okay, my just you resend the first link only no i know but it is showing the same link that's the problem to share never mind tech tech is sometimes always a bit tricky so. uh let me show you what we have okay Can you see my screen? Yes. All right. So lots of uh, fun words out there. Mood, intimacy, gender, bonding, relationship, orientation, marriage, chemistry, babies, male, female, intersex, two people, sexuality, hotness, judgment, hidden, trust, chemistry, trust, pleasure, right? I have an additional question, which perhaps you can... Um, which perhaps you can uh, actually answer uh, in the chat. You don't want to spend so much time on the Mentimeter. You can just post your responses in the chat. And if you think this format is uncomfortable, you can also just say we do not want to respond to this in the chat. And if I don't see any responses, which would mean that nobody would want to respond to this question, right? This is...
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I would say thank you so much for answering both the questions. Um, is there's one thing, of course, we're talking about a lot of things here, which, um, which we understand are uncomfortable and uh, something that we often don't feel very confident talking about. There's a lot of judgment that is associated with sex or sexuality or sexual pleasure, and that is all understandable. So one of the things which I would request all of you is that this is a safe space for all of us to have this discussion. Um, ideally, I feel that, you know, one hour is very, very little time to even sort of unpack what we're going to talk about ideally i would have loved to do this, do this workshop in person you know sort of across two days and um, i mean i would i would hope we would be able to do that in future i would love to do it um, but whatever we can do in this you know next the um, uh, next one one and a half hours or whatever is to really dig into what sexual pleasure sort of means for all of us um, you know a lot of things that you've all shared for both the questions point towards one thing that we, when we talk about sexual pleasure, we know that it is, it is reflected in our in our personal and professional life, um, in some ways, right? Even in professional life, things that perhaps we do at work, you know, some of us have profiles where we are more closely working on certain issues, and of course, this thing which is uh, which is very close to our individual personal lives, and we all have different views on this. There is no one, th you know, explanation of what we all can have around sexual pleasure because it's also very very personal. When people think about pleasure, uh, they all tend to think of physical dimensions, right? Of sexual pleasure. First thing that possibly comes to our mind when we talk about the act of sex, about the physical dimensions of, um, of both of these. Um, but sexual pleasure actually goes way beyond physical satisfaction and is very, very much related to an individual's freedom of sexual expression which can be different for different people, right? What we possibly understand of sex and sexual pleasure is what we possibly know. No, because of really, you know, whatever information is out there, whatever has been shared with us so far, whatever is really more popular and normal. Um, and, and we often feel that that's the right way to feel pleasure, or that there is only one way to feel or express sexual pleasure. But that's not reality. People around the world, we're all different. And we, we all may feel different about different things, right? Not, not all of us are going to enjoy the same things around sex. What sex could, what intercourse could mean uh, for one person as something really amazing could mean something um, really disgusting for the other, right? Um, uh, in a lot of places in, in cultural context, um, there are some of, you know, some of these things around, um, let's say we talk about masturbation, which is, um, I would say the, you know, the topic that we are tired of answering because the number of questions that we get regarding masturbation and it's going to make people sick and it is going to affect people's performance. It's just amazing the kind of myths and misconceptions which are out there. But that's also something which where, you know, a lot of cultural context sort of comes in play. Uh, social norms come into play in terms of how we understand and express or talk about sexual pleasure. And there is no problem in, you know, sort of keeping uh, your thoughts around sex and, and sexuality and sexual pleasure private. Ultimately, it's you need to have the freedom uh, to decide how you want to express it, how much you want to talk about it. So there is no right and wrong, but it is very, very important to understand the diversity when we talk about sexual pleasure and really minutely look at some of the specifics when we talk about sexual pleasure and what it, um, you know, uh, sort of what it includes. So when we talk about sexual pleasure, the first definition of sexual pleasure was actually uh, crafted by us at the Global Advisory Board on Sexual Health and Wellbeing, which is the most widely accepted definition uh, on sexual pleasure. And there are some nuances attached with that definition, which are important to understand, uh, where we talk about the fact that sexual pleasure, we often tend to think about it as an act which is, you know, which is a shared experience and a shared erotic experience, um, but not necessarily so, you know, when we talk about sexual pleasure, this can also be a solitary experience. Um, it can be an experience in a relationship, but it can also be something that a person would want to or wants to experience or experiences um, uh, with themselves. 
Um, and uh, and so there is no one way to look at or interpret what sexual pleasure is. Uh, second, sexual pleasure cannot be and should not be taken for granted. It's not something that we feel, you know, often people, I mean, of course, we're always told that sex is something that people eventually just learn, right? I mean, there is no sex education needed because you eventually get to know about it, right? I mean, you can see Bollywood movies and you can see the flowers and the bees and, you know, so you, you'll get you'll get to know what it is. But that's, we all know uh, where we land with, in, with information or with, let's say, no information or misinformation around sex because um, most of the information that comes to people is actually from pornography, which is not really what real sex is like, which is not really what real sex in real life is all about. Um, it, is, uh, it is something that needs to be learned in context of really understanding what it really must include for both the partners or for an individual. And there are certain, certain um, I would say aspects when we talk about self-determination, when we talk about consent, when we talk about safety, privacy, and confidence, the ability to be able to communicate and to be able to negotiate. These are all extremely important factors uh, when we talk about sexual pleasure, when we really look at the definition of sexual pleasure. Um, also because there are no you know, universal rules or values around it, uh, different cultures have and different religions have a very different way of articulating what sexuality and sexual pleasure, if at all, they accept sexual pleasure. I mean, uh, for most part, it is not something that, uh, you know, that is uh, sort of accepted and talked about, but it is different. And then sexual pleasure is for all ages. It isn't like uh, somebody who's a 50 year old or a 60 year old uh, shouldn't or would not want to experience sexual pleasure. There are lots of things that we tend to think about uh, sexual pleasure or sex life, which we have to really look at a life course approach. Um, and we tend to really look at a few years in an, you know, in an individual's life where you would, where you would really see them as sexually active or somebody who would want to experience sexual pleasure. But that's our understanding in terms of what we feel about the right age um, or, uh, you know, uh, really the evolving capacities, let's say, of young people in terms of when and how uh, they would want to initiate sex or the fact that after a certain age, you're not interested in, in sex. But all of these generalized comments um, are, are not so true when we really look at uh, private lives of people because uh, sex and sexual pleasure can have a very, very different meaning and can be a very unique experience for everyone at different stages of life cycle, right? Because the moment we tend to think of sexual pleasure as hardcore intercourse, um, that's where we limit ourselves in terms of really even understanding what sex and sexual pleasure should be all about, right? Um, and there is no one way to sort of look at it. It's really a relationship that you can have with someone or with yourself and everybody can enjoy different things or not enjoy anything at all. Um, and, uh, and these are all individual choices, of course. Uh, no one decides to be, you know, just suddenly just decides that, oh, I am, I want to be different and I want to try uh, homosexual sex and from tomorrow I'm going to turn into a homosexual. It doesn't work like that. Um, these are, uh, everybody would have preferred sexual practices or acts uh, based on really understanding their own needs and desires and how they would want to really express themselves. So gender, sexuality and pleasure are very, very closely related. Um, it is not just binary. When I say binary, it is not just about man and woman. Um, it is not, uh, you know, gender is something that we, uh, that we construct, that we live. Um, and it is constructed by the society we live in. Um, it, is, it is really, uh, you know, sort of reflected in uh, the social norms. Um, and there is a lot of things that, you know, you, you look at inequality, you look at power uh, differences, you look at gender discrimination. All of these things have a very, very strong role to play when we talk about how gender and sexuality and pleasure are very closely intertwined. Um, and gender roles and stereotypes, we know, you know, shape, shape, shape sexual relationships. We know that there are inequalities between men and women, which are often reflected in sexual relationships. There are double standards when we talk about sexual activities and in, in many cultures, um, you know, we are obsessed about uh, virginity when we're also obsessed about uh, uh, women's virginity. It's not so much that defines, you know, a, 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 boy's, a boy's life. Uh, young women are supposed to sort of be very coy and, you know, sort of not know anything about sex and sort of not engage in any kind of premarital sex. And there are, there are social norms around it, right? Um, and likewise, 
young men and boys are told that you shouldn't be asking questions about sex. I mean, come on, you have to be all macho. You have to know everything. So either talk to your friends and peers about it. Or, and, and of course, the fact that you also cannot let out all your questions or insecurities when it comes to sex, because that's not part of being a real man. Uh, and, and uh, you know, and, and there are lots of questions that both um, that all genders have, right? I mean, around sex and sexuality, it's, it's very, very normal to have that. I remember my experience of, you know, sort of, I am from Alwar, Rajasthan. I grew up in a boarding school in Dehradun all my life. Um, and, you know, how I mean, uh, the times when you were growing up, it was sort of, uh, you really felt the pressure, even though the pressure was not coming from your home, the pressure was really to fit in as in the good girl category, right? There are certain things that you do because you have to be a good girl, which also included that you should never, ever be engaging in any conversation around sex, right? Uh, there's a certain size of your skirt. There are certain things that obviously define what a, what a good girl would mean um, and not, not even, you know, try having a relationship and all of that. Um, or the fact that, you know, uh, there are certain things which are okay and there are certain things which are problematic, which means being a gay or a lesbian or thinking otherwise non-binary is hugely problematic. Um, and that's and that's really you know uh, what I thought of is sex and sexuality. One, stay quiet about it. Uh, second, of course, there's no other way of being except for you know sort of just play simple heterosexual straight relationships. Um, and and that's what education does to you, right? Uh, that's what exposure does to you when you when you when you are able to engage yourself in quality, good quality science and fact based information. When you're able to uh, be in a space where you can actually challenge your own beliefs and biases and opinions because we are all product of the society that we you know that we come from that is when you really learn and then you're really able to question a lot of things where where our own biases and our judgments lie and we are all on this journey you know one of the things that we often say I mean I often say at Love Matters is that we don't judge people for how little they know because we're not speaking to the converted right our big challenge is we are speaking to um to the audience in tier two cities tier three cities um in rural areas where there are very very defined notions of patriarchy um and not so much to say that the metro uh, city you know metros and bigger cities don't have it i think it's very much reflected you know everywhere around us but the big challenge is to be able to take them on a journey where they can unlearn what they have unfortunately learned because of the community the society the family that we belong to, uh, and which is not to downgrade anyone to tell them how little you know, right? Um, there are times when people have made fun of others, you know, when we talk about body image issues, when we talk about gays and lesbians relationships and transgender people, a lot of times uh, people are insensitive about saying what they're saying is because they don't know any better. Everybody's trying to fit into this culture of, well, this is a cool thing, right? You make fun of certain things um, because it's the right thing and it is not normal and people are trying to be a certain, a certain way just to gain attention. So it's very important to be able to actually engage in these conversations without telling a person that, you know what, you don't know enough. Uh, you don't know enough, but yes, I mean, the idea is to really have that conversation and take someone else on a journey, just like perhaps all of it, just like I have had to really unlearn and unpack and be able to, you know, sort of say that this, there is a lot of problem, you know, the way we grow up, the kind of education that we are, you know, exposed to, and there is a need uh, to be able to do better. I mean, I would definitely want uh, something better for my child and to have, you know, have an understanding. He's 10, but he understands diversity, he understands what it means, uh, you know, what inclusiveness really means. Uh, we have very, very open conversations. And, and then to be able to accept that, I mean, I wasn't personally ready for this when my 10 year old said that, Mama, I have to have this conversation with you that I, um, I came across some in inappropriate material on YouTube. Just the confidence that he could walk up to me and say that to me, because I mean, and we're living in Corona times, right? There is a push to, for everything to be online and digital. And this is a big, bad world, right? I mean, there are good things with internet. There are bad things with internet. Not talking about it, shying away is not going to help. And this education has to go on. Uh, when I'm speaking to a lot of medical students or young people or SRHR professionals, you know, it is often, uh, you know, we, we, we really uh, try to, you know, sort of, really have a discussion that at what age perhaps these conversations should have had happen, should have happened because by the time we actually engage in these conversations we we tend to think about certain things in a certain way and as we age it is even more difficult for us to mold our thinking in a certain way 
uh, but some certain things when they are introduced at a foundational level. So for example, if children are going to learn in school, you know, really early on about consent, um, and, and I mean, you know what children at even at one and two understand yes and no, uh, come to think of it, what they want, what they don't want, they really know what to say and yes and no to. So just, just really trying to tell them what it means to say yes and to say no, uh, how to understand and respect boundaries, um, what does really diversity really mean? I think these are these are things which need to be introduced at a foundational level. Um, and of course, becomes an important part of um, I would say our, our, our curriculum as, as healthcare professionals, as medical students, it is so important um, that this is sort of central to, uh, you know, your practice, because I think one thing really when we talk about sexual pleasure is to really keep the judgment away. And as doctors, as healthcare professionals, if we can just learn the fact that, you know, all uh, people are different. We, try, we judge people, uh, you know, from the backgrounds they come from what they're wearing, how they are. There's a lot of judgment that comes from healthcare professionals uh, towards people. And especially that's when we talk about young women seeking abortion services, uh, when there are young women who are trying to talk about contraceptive choices. Um, even though we have, you know, Rashtriya uh, Kishore Swasthya Yojana, uh, we have Yuva Clinics, uh, the footfall is, is negligible. You know, there isn't, the young people aren't going to these spaces because they feel, we did a survey where they felt that they're going to be judged for what a service they're going to ask for what information they would they would um, they would look for there is a problem and the big problem when we when we you know sort of uh, try try to speak to young people is that well healthcare facilities staff uh, they really judge us um, you know uh, for for possibly uh, being sexually active or going for a particular contraceptive choice um, and there is this fear that you know um, uh, that the fact that of course you cannot have uh, an abortion and lots of things kind of associated with it. And it brings back the question that, should we be able to really think about what our responsibility is as providers, um, as human beings, you know, when we are doing, uh, when, when we are giving out a service, should we be really judging someone for the information they need or for the service they possibly are looking for? And that's where, then that's really where, um, I mean, that's where really where I think we really, really need to focus. Um, at at the Global Advisory Board, we are trying to do these trainings across, you know, uh, especially focused on medical uh, students, healthcare professionals, a lot of young people to really gain a recognition of sexuality as a positive aspect of human life, not something that is ne negative, and then really to effectively make the linkages between sexual health rights and pleasure. Um, and it is very important that somebody who is seeking for, um, you know, seeking contraceptive advice is not just given one contraception option, but is, is given a, a basket of choices uh, to be able to, to really get information, make an informed choice about what is it that is going that I would want, uh, be able to ask those questions to the healthcare provider without feeling any shame and stigma. And at the same time, um, you know, uh, I mean, of course, uh, doctors are very busy, healthcare professionals are very busy, so I'm not saying that everybody has to turn into a counselor, but um, it is such an important aspect of, uh, you know, treating your client to be able to perhaps in some ways have some support from a counselor where, um, you know, you can really, re you can really be able to support the patient with some good quality information, also in terms of understanding their own individual selves and what they want. Um, most of the time, dignity in healthcare is what um, is what is what they really miss, especially women and girls in our country. They really, really miss what uh, dignity in healthcare, which means that they, you know, they would be respected for the question. There will be a basket of choices which uh, will be available for them in terms of information, and they will be supported to make an informed choice. And uh, where needed, uh, you know, there will be an enabling environment where they can actually go and have a conversation with their partner and or perhaps the family members or find support, let's say even in ASHA workers or otherwise. Um, so, I mean, the objective really is that, you know, we are able to provide sex positive uh, information and counseling and support to, to clients uh, while delivering services. Um, and it's not possible for, for all doctors to do that, but I think it's a good idea to really think of services where a counselor where some sex positive approach um, and counselor support is available with healthcare professionals and in hospitals uh, sort of at, at all times. Um, there are a few things that, um, that I wanted to 
discuss uh, and let's see how we can you know sort of do this uh, it'll be it'll be a yes and no where i just want to you know sort of uh, ask you i'm i'm just going to uh, put out some statements uh, and uh, you have to just you know sort of respond saying acceptable or unacceptable good okay so the first statement is sex between two partners of the same sex acceptable or unacceptable completely acceptable i'm delighted to see so many acceptables and it's also okay if um, if somebody feels it is unacceptable because i think it is important to be honest with our own judgments and biases um and we are all on a you know sort of a learning journey uh, so it's totally fine all right the second statement is about uh, anal sex acceptable unacceptable i think that's a that's a very important point that has been acceptable if consensual absolutely any act of sex anything um works only and is acceptable only and only if it is consensual um it is very important to be able to say yes to something as much as it is important to say no to something most often we are told to be able to you know we, there's a lot of talk about the fact that you if you if you do not want something no means no it's obviously very important but i think we need to empower ourselves also to be able to say yes to things that we want uh you know and and that really means accepting our body and sexuality and what works for us and really understanding you know um uh, your own self and what works for you when it comes to your sexual health and right and pleasure um okay the third statement is sex without uh, protection or condom Okay. Okay. So consent is important, but otherwise, you know, it's um, it's a it's a fifty fifty. So it's unacceptable and acceptable, really. Okay. A forty year old uh, woman having a relationship and a sexual relationship with a twenty one year old uh, man. Acceptable, unacceptable. and i'm talking about a consensual relationship okay interesting you know this is a statement that really made me think about um my own biases and judgments because um um i actually thought this was an acceptable and that was my personal thing and it 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 really took a lot of courage for me to say that you know i do judge anyone uh, uh with the with a significant you know sort of age group and perhaps that comes from my background of you know sort of uh, working on certain cases um, as my specialization as a as a specialist on human trafficking where i've seen a lot of uh power how power works in a certain relationship and i realized that it was so strong because i had personally looked at certain things in cases that i uh, i do have very um, you know i don't think it is completely acceptable for me even if it is consensual uh, perhaps because i have seen power work in a, in a in a different way in a in a certain relationship but that's that's the that's the bias or judgment that i had to accept that i intrinsically have and i try to be very honest about it because when working on sexual pleasure and health and rights i need to be aware that this is a bias i have and i need to check on myself and say that no you cannot you have to move away from that lens and this is a consensual relationship and yes there could be far other issues there are all kinds of possibilities but you need to be able to make space uh, to to really look at you know that picture where 
perhaps this is a perfectly healthy relationship, right? There is, even though there is, um, you know, there's a significant age gap, there is power that is not playing in the way we kind of look at it. So it's also being aware as a professional about your own biases and judgments that can come from, you know, sort of any, any personal experience or any professional experience. Um, having sex with multiple partners, acceptable, unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. So these were uh, just some of the statements that I mean, I, that I shared, just to um, sort of uh, really ask ourselves, you know, what do we think about some of these things? And there is no right and wrong, like I shared, I, but it is really important that as, as I would say, as professionals, as human beings, we are aware of our own biases and judgment. Um, and, and, and these kind of, you know, we're talking about sex and sexual pleasure at this point of time, but, but you pick a variety of topics around us and you would see how loaded we are with judgment because of our personal and, prof- and, and professional experiences around something. Um, but this was just sort of, uh, you know, an exercise to one, talk about your biases, but also to say that there are different ways of being and there are all kinds of relationships and there are all kinds of sexual preferences that people have. Some might be acceptable for some people, some might be unacceptable for some people. Uh, Generally and largely, what is unacceptable and acceptable is is really decided by community and society at large. Um, And and that is where a lot of, you know, uh, when we talk about um, a lot of issues or problems also emerge, right? I mean, when we talk about what binary and non-binary relationships, when we talk about what is normal and what is abnormal, it comes from the fact that um, has this been, uh, you know, sort of approved by community and society at large or not. Um, likewise, you know, a, a, the age gap between between two partners, even though they are both majors, 21 and 40, um, and even though it is a consensual relationship, there is a lot of judgment that is loaded uh, just because it's not something that is, considered acceptable in general. But there are all kinds of relationships and all of those relationships, considering they're consensual, all kinds of sexual acts, considering they're consensual. And when we're talking about both the partners, like consent, when we're talking about consent, it's both parties are involved. One person might want to do something and the other person might not want to do something. What do we do in a case like that, right? Um, One wants to um, have sex wearing a condom, the other one prefers not to so and it's a tricky situation right we all land up in situations like this and they're very real life situations but it is important that we acknowledge our biases we acknowledge the i would say the tension uh, when it comes to some of these situations um and of course moving on there are a few things that i i actually want to leave you with is how uh, you know, when, when somebody's speaking to you about or, or coming to you in terms of advice for sexual health, um, what, is, what are some of those key things that you will, you know, sort of um, talk about just in terms of, you know, telling someone what, what makes for a good, healthy relationship or good health and well-being um, or a relationship where we're talking about, um, you know, uh, mutual sexual pleasure is one, treat your partner as a human being and not as a body or object. Um, it is... Uh, I mean, for me, it is, uh, it is something that I find extremely challenging that most of the questions that we get on a daily basis on our website are uh, regarding um, abortion pills, which, are, which come from uh, young men. Women are not asking these questions. And, and, the, and the way the questions are sort of asked and framed are largely in lines of, well, um, I don't want to wear a condom, but I've been giving my, giving my girlfriend one pill every day. 
I hope that's going to be okay. That's going to be fine, right? I mean, she's not going to get pregnant. And it's surprising, all of these questions around abortion pills actually come usually, I would say about a high 90 to 95% come from young men. And it just, uh, you know, it's, it's really about how um, you're, you're treating your partner's body as, you know, body as an object and not really as a human being. Um, so as a, as a sexuality educator, um, and as someone who, who would advise uh, to not only to clients, but also to, you know, uh, to young people when talking to them is you have to treat your partner like a human being. What you wouldn't accept for yourself is also unacceptable to your partner. And we have to acknowledge, you know, power in, uh, you know, uh, that comes into play when we're talking about these relationships. And which is why a lot of women and girls actually do not, are not even taking these decisions about their own body themselves. Um, secondly, you have to strike the right balance between play, seriousness, sensuality, and intimacy, right? There has to be a right balance. What can be, life is not 50 shades of gray for those who have watched it, right? Um, it's much more complicated. It is, um, uh, it is uh, sort of something that works for one, doesn't work for other one. And um, all kinds of, you know, so uh, all kinds of acts that one might enjoy, um, the other partner might enjoy, but there could be one thing or two that they will they, they do not want to, you know, sort of say yes to. So there has to be a the right kind of balance. It also is something that should not hurt your partner uh, because end of the day, sexual pleasure is not just about being very experimental, you know, when it comes to sex. For someone, it could just mean, you know, uh, hugging or holding hands and for the other person it could mean trying out different positions so it, it is very very different but I think it is really about striking the right balance and between the two partners uh, then of course giving pleasure to your partner and also accept being pleased this is how consent works um, so you when we when we're talking about sexual pleasure we have to understand and we have to talk about that you have to give sorry one second please hold on I'm so sorry about this. Yeah, so uh, while it is important to, you know, give pleasure to your partner, it is also important that you accept being pleased. It's uh, most often a lot of women and girls feel that it is their responsibility to please their partner, but they do not often feel uh, confident enough to really ask that there is something that I want and I need and which is, and, and which will make me feel good. So also accepting being pleased is an important part. And which requires obviously communication skills, communicate what you want, what you do not want to happen, ask for a, for a yes and accept a no. So both of these things are extremely important. And my advice will be be safe. I would always advise people to, um, uh, to wear condoms, uh, stay safe. And I think it is not just about avoiding an un unwanted pregnancy. I think it is also about keeping yourself safe from any kind of STI or STD. If you're engaging in sex with multiple partners, of course, the risk is higher. Um, and uh, I mean, of course, I mean, I think the biggest challenge for me as a sexuality educator is when a lot of young people tell me that I understand, I understand that condoms are important. But when you say that it is just as pleasurable as doing it without the, con as, uh, without the condoms, I do not agree. And frankly, it's a challenge. I don't have an answer to that, right? With or without, where does that? But I think it's also really comes from the fact that condoms right from the beginning were, were sort of marketed as, uh, as something uh, that would prevent a disease. And we were talking about, you know, sort of the HIV AIDS movement in India and how that product was marketed. Um, and now if you see largely how the, uh, the condom markets and if you look at the branding and how they're talking about the product is more around pleasure, of course, I wouldn't say I think a lot of um, products are um, really objectifying women in a, in a, in a certain way. Uh, but um, let's say, I mean, I would talk about Durex because obviously uh, I'm, I'm, I'm as, as a chair, but also as someone who's guiding Durex as a product in terms of if you look at the commercials, if you look at the product line, if you look at the packaging, we're really focusing on diversity, inclusivity. We're really sort of trying to, you know, sort of really bring in those elements that um, that make this makes this product really speak to. I uh, really, you know, I would say 
understand the the value between sexual health rights and pleasure and how to bring that balance out even in the marketing strategy um i would like to pause here and actually take questions from all of you uh, i think it is important that i mean in a workshop format there is just so much interaction that happens face to face um it was difficult to for me to pack everything in this session um but yes i'm really looking forward to actually just more interaction right now so if there are questions that i can hear from all of you uh some thoughts on what what i have possibly been talking about so far i would love to hear from you If you would like to unmute yourself, then just raise your hands. I'll unmute. And like I mentioned, this is a safe space, so we should be able to. I mean, as healthcare professionals, as as young people, I mean, I would uh, I would hope that we have an open and honest discussion here, and this is a safe space, so um, we shouldn't be worried about. I think Aditi has a question first. Hello, ma'am. Hi. I just wanted to share my experience. So a few days back, I went on a health camp for arranged with Kadusha Sundi. It was about women's menstrual health awareness program. So I'm basically a physiotherapist student. So uh, I was asking a woman who was uh, around thirty year old. She told me her age was thirty, and she the I asked her what all pains, her joint pain she is having in the body, and uh, she told me she has back pain and lower back pain and uh, knee pain. I was listening to her very carefully, and then uh, she started sharing with me. She actually thought I was an actual doctor, and uh, she th told me that uh, while having intercourse, like at the age of thirty. she is a mother of four kids and uh, she was married to young and uh, she has four kids and due to religious barriers she is not allowed to use any contraceptions and uh, it it gets very painful while intercourse after having so many kids and she has severe back pain and lower back pain pelvic pain due to that so like she was asking me what should i do like i she i told her that i didn't know what to tell her and i was not in a position to give her any advice so i told her i am not a real doctor and you should visit a real doctor if it's painful and all i could confide her is like you are allowed to say no if it's get painful the sex isn't supposed to be painful at all and contraceptions is like your right if you don't want if you want to use it you have to speak for it that's all i could tell her thank you aditi i am uh, actually delighted to hear you know uh, your response uh, to the person and the fact that you actually made her feel supported you talked to her about what was her right about the choices that are available um and and these are all negative aspects of sexuality which of obviously are a reality of the society there are abusive relationships for sex sexual violence harmful traditional practices and this is all happening within marital relationships and outside of marital relationships and it is important um to be able to i think as a provider to be able to understand and tell your client that you know sexual coercion um is wrong um and uh, this can be reported and there has to be an understanding of sexual consent which which obviously is something that you would speak to the client and where needed to to the partner as well uh, and so important to be and uh, to be clear on the limits of what is appropriate and inappropriate behavior um even within a marital relationship uh which means you know of course knowing that you have a right to say yes and no to something at the age of 30 with four with four kids married at a young age clear it's it's very very clear that she is not you know sort of she's been forced into sex she's uh she has been forced into having kids she never had access to any contraception and she did not know you know what to do about it and it's really sad and unfortunately that's the reality of uh, millions and millions of um, girls out there um and i think uh you know even though it is difficult for uh, for every medical professional and for you to be able to do that to every client who comes to you i think it was um it is really heartening to know that the way you intervene and the conversation you had prashant thank you so much ma'am thank you prashant you have raised your hand yeah yeah good evening ma'am uh, i am a I am a medical uh, 
doctor uh, basically i am a intern trainee doctor i have completed my mbbs final year and now i am doing my internship ma'am uh, as we all know that uh, uh, basically in the adult populations uh, mostly the boys have the misconception in their mind about the g point and it is fine uh, their partners in that so as we all know that uh, it is a myth because there is no such point uh, or there is no such g point as called because there is a only a pouch of douglas which is called full de sac and that is what regarded as some some people or some literature have said that like uh, it is a g point or that so ma'am uh, how we can uh, tell uh, that it is a uh, tell them that it is a myth it is not a true point or it is not a, a like uh, anything anatomical which is present in a female body uh very good question prashant um and actually uh, most often this this really comes from the fact that when we talk about anatomy uh you know that is not clearly understood by people it is something yeah, where yeah. we depend not on bi biology books also and obviously there are certain things here. so when 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 i talk about biology actually you would be surprised that world over um in any of the biology books around the world the clitoris is not sort of featured in an yeah. image and that that talks about something right this something and and it's it's something that we know exists right some may want to call it whatever we're not talking about the g spot here right we don't know g spot or what spot it is but there is a there is a there is an organ which is clitoris which is you know which helps a woman experience pleasure and that part is sort of not talked about at the same time there are myths and misconceptions that oh there is this kind of a spot so essentially you know when we say there is a g spot it is people try to you know sort of understand that there, this is something that exists in exactly the same place or whatever spot it is um across all female bodies which is not true and yeah. like you said people need to have a clearer picture of what bodies are like what does the, what are the organs what is the specific function of every organ and try and you there are i mean the good thing is now there are lots of good resources which are out there which actually can be shared with these people and these clients there are some really good visual uh, you know sort of videos and uh, uh, really good uh, videos which are also simple uh, to explain in terms of you know the quite kind of questions that people have around bodies um but yes i mean i think the confusion also comes from the fact that we are not naming the body parts right um there is a clitoris and we don't want to call it clitoris clitoris in fact we do not want to talk about it at all um female genital mutilation is all about that the clitoris is basically cut off and and this is a practice which is done um by specific community also in india as well as you know other parts of the world where the clitoris is basically cut off at a young age um which is child sexual exploitation in a way and the family is get it done and what could be the primitive thinking behind doing this is to be able to make sure that a woman does not enjoy pleasure she will continue to engage in the act of sex but it only has to work for the man it should never work for the woman and and that's where i think uh, you know a lot of these complexities kind of come up uh, trying to say that there is a there is a g spot and i i mean i would say um uh, you know the thing around g spot uh, at least it will make men try right <laughs> that there yeah. is something that they need to work hard for <laughs> actually uh, yeah, actually uh, i searched the literature on this and uh, i found that uh, there was one scientist and uh, he just uh, suggested this and there is no anatomical uh, proof or any anatomical uh, uh, existence of it and he just uh, given the name and he just supposed that um, it might be a uh, some place in the female genital organ that might yeah. be giving the pleasure but it is not yet found and uh, yeah. no literature yet yeah possibly the clitoris that the person yeah, 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 I, uh, and and what what i found after reviewing the literature i found that uh, at some point of time uh, the culde sac which is we call the uh, pouch of douglas uh, that, that is what we regard it as the uh, uh, most pleasure point and so yeah so i want to clear from this back uh, this uh, platform that uh, there is no such g point and i want to say that at this platform that's why so yeah. the people here should learn this and may communicate with their fellow one yes Thank and you. and the, but there is clitoris and we should yeah, all yeah, become yeah, yeah. and we should all become clitoris advocates right <laughs>
Sure, sure. It's sure. like female genital many mutilation should absolutely, absolutely, exactly, absolutely exactly. Stop everyone. That is child sexual exploitation, and at no cause that should happen to any child in any part of the world. Yeah. Thank you. Prashant, thank you. I have another question, which is uh, what is your opinion on premarital sex? Um, as for this question, I would say my personal opinion is that I personally believe in evolving capacities of young people. Um, and uh, which means that uh, there is, you know, obviously our legally it is defined that 18 and younger are minor um, and um, over 18 you're allowed to have sex. In my personal opinion, you cannot have a preset, uh, you know, sort of a defined age uh, because it doesn't work like that. Um, children have evolving capacities and some, um, you know, sort of might want to engage in an act of sex at the age of 16 and might feel ready with information and saying that, well, I understand concern and this is what I want to do. And there is somebody who might not want to, uh, might not feel ready even at the age of 25. Um, so how do we really decide, you know, what is, what is really okay and what is not okay? Uh, in my personal opinion about premarital sex, as long as we're talking about two consensual adults, it is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely fine. I don't think, um, you know, marriage is going to define or change something uh, in a relationship drastically, but that's my personal opinion. But as long as it's consensual, um, it, is, it is something uh, where both, uh, both adults as in majors, and the reason why I'm saying that is also while I, in, while I believe in evolving capacities of young people, it is important to abide by the law. Um, Currently, the law in the country uh, defines the age of um, um, sort of a major as 18 and above. Um, so, so yes, um, when we're talking about consensual sex between adults, I would look at that age group. Um, besides the point that I believe in the evolving uh, capacities of, of human beings. So um, in my personal judgment, I find it a little tricky that how do you define that a 17 year old and an 18 year old? But like, ma'am, uh, sorry to cut you here. I think so that uh, de the designated that 18 is an adult. It is because there are some uh, healthcare problems also related to unsafe uh, sex practices. In young women, especially HPV infection and all of those, like, you know, in the adolescent age group. So they are at a high risk of getting this infection if they, uh, in, at a very early age, if they start practicing sex, whether they have complete information or not. So that's why I think so that age your limitation has been there that beyond 18 it should be practiced yeah yes. because uh, cervical cancer is a very common uh, you know, increasing risk of uh, cancer that is very common in India and it shows us its effects after 10 20 years and the prognosis is not if not detected early the prognosis is really very lethal it can be very fatal so that I think why in, yeah I think you bring in a very, very important point. And I think the reason why I'm talking about 18 is because, um, I mean, I think world over, we need to have a more universal approach to um, to a legal age. Um, I mean, I would say, you know, let's say, I mean, I, I think we can't compare countries, but there are a lot of countries, let's say Nordic countries where 16, uh, you know, really is the age. I mean, I, I feel that um, personally, I feel a person at whatever age needs to feel completely ready mentally, emotionally, and I might sound very, um, very old when I say this, but I also feel you have to be financially ready for certain things. I'm very old school in certain things. I mean, I feel, you know, your, whatever your actions will have certain repercussions and you should be on your own and feel, um, you know, sort of also financially uh, be able to take care of certain decisions that you take, right? Even if it means um, uh, it means, you know, going for an abortion or otherwise, Definitely. or make contraceptive choices. So that's really my personal thing. But I think to answer the question around premarital sex, I think marriage is, you know, is, is something that I, I don't think is very important, but that's my, that's my personal opinion. Um, but knowing what you're getting into, knowing that this is safe for you, knowing uh, that you're mentally, physically, as well as financially ready to, to take certain decisions or to handle certain repercussions is extremely important. So that's that would be my uh, response. There is another question, which is, um, what are the challenges an unmarried and sexually active female seeking gynecological help would face? Many. <clears throat> Uh, I think uh, there is enough, uh, I mean, um, we, we have done a lot of work in this area where a lot of young people 
have uh, shared and young girls have shared that they feel um, extremely uncomfortable going and accessing any services, and especially when it comes to abortion. Um, it is not somewhere where we where they get the support, even if and if this is not just about minors. I mean, this is also this is really in context of premarital sex. So even a 25 year old um, uh, girl, uh, you know, going for uh, an abortion who's not married is is bound to face face issues, problems. Um, and of course, uh, we don't have the time to get into the MTP Act, but um, that's where also, you know, sort of certain things kind of plain we have with the recent amendment to the MTP Act. Um, you know, things have sort of improved, but there is a long way to go still. Um, many, many challenges. I mean, I can't, I can, I have a whole list and, and things become even more difficult when we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, different states and rural areas. Like I said, dignity in healthcare is something that is absolutely, absolutely missing. And when we talk about young people, and especially the struggle that young women and girls have, um, it is just really, really, really hard. Uh, and also, I mean, I think just the fact that uh, the, the healthcare provider sees themselves in such a position of power that they can say anything, they can, you know, the looks, it, most often a lot of girls feel that the whole intention is to not make them feel at ease. Uh, and that's where the big problem is that why is this missing in our healthcare industry, right? And why is it, for most importantly, like why is it really missing when we talk about, um, you know, public healthcare? So that's, 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 what I would say, I mean, the problems are huge. And I think that's an important part of advocacy and activism, uh, where people, uh, and especially young women and girls should, uh, should feel respected, should feel dignity, and absolutely anywhere, anywhere, you know, no matter who you are, man or woman, or at any age, you should feel that you have a right uh, to dignity when accessing healthcare. And I personally feel very, very strongly about it. Uh, I have another question, what is your opinion on safe consensual sex between adults who are not exactly in a committed relationship? Okay, so you're talking about a casual relationship. I mean, again, as long as there are two uh, uh, adults who are consenting, I mean, it could be a one, uh, you know, one time sex or it, I don't have uh, uh, any opinions. I mean, I don't, I think it's the same opinion, right? It's a consensual, it's a Tinder date, and it's fine. I mean, it's whatever people choose to do. Uh, while being consensual, of course, I think it's absolutely, absolutely fine. Again, people have to know what kind of, uh, you know, uh, how much they can, you know, sort of uh, possibly deal with in terms of emotions and otherwise. A lot of people might, uh, you know, even in a, a, a relationship such as this one, some someone might feel committed, the other one might feel, um, you know, it's a casual relationship for me. So it also really depends who is asking me this question. If there's a, the person asking this question, somebody who feels that, oh, this is a casual relationship for me, so that be it. If somebody feels that, well, I got into this relationship thinking and expecting commitment, um, you know, my, um, again, uh, my thing, my advice would be, you need to see and be able to really, you know, see if this is going to add on to uh, more mental issues or emotional issues for you. Do you really want to do it? Is it really worth it and otherwise? Um, so while it has to be consensual, it is also something that you need to be mentally and emotionally, physically be really prepared for, be it casual or committed. Uh, okay, there's another one. Uh, I once freezed when my then partner initiated sex and got PTSD due to it. I'm lucky I received help. My question is that, is there any way to avoid the freezing moment? I read that it is physiological. We both did understand consent at that time. Um, and this is uh, this is something that is uh, you know experienced of course by a lot of uh, by a lot of people, um, and I remember that uh, you know this is something that I think I also experienced uh, when when um, when I you know sort of got into first time sex my sexual experience and first time sex is not so rosy and stuff right it's it can be different for different people and it's messy and it's full of anxiety and and it is all okay you know because it is actually not supposed to be perfect and uh, perhaps you had that moment um, and uh, you should definitely I mean um, one thing is to speak to the to, to the provider uh, and to be able to speak to a counselor and share it and the most important thing is to be able to acknowledge that feeling and actually communicate with your partner about it um, I think uh, at that point of time um, like you said, you know, you both did not understand consent, um, which is which is what our sexual experiences are all about, right? Um, most often our first sexual experiences are not so great. Um, there is too much pressure, um, too much that you do not know. Um, 
a lot of times um, am i ready for it and am i not ready for it you know you re you're really unsure and these are all um, really normal situations so um i think to be able to avoid that freezing moment my suggestion will be to really uh, really be able to ask yourself are you ready for it or not and it could well be that you feel you're prepared for it but during the act you just you might just feel that no this is not something that's working for me stop right there tell your partner i think it is so important to be honest about it and right from the beginning i mean it is also be important that you're honest about this perhaps with your uh, uh, present partner or future partners because it is just about being honest and accepting that this is perhaps uh, an issue that happened and i'm yet to you know sort of uh, get over it uh, so being open about it acknowledging and owning it is i think um, is i think extremely important and like i said speaking to a counselor it um, it is it is going to be helpful uh, is it okay to not be sexually ready like not feel like you don't want it absolutely okay i mean i think you can you can feel like one day you want to do it and the other day you can feel like no i don't want to do it so there is there is no ready guide to it that you know um, should i be sexually ready just because my partner is ready i think it is absolutely normal everyone is different um and it is important to acknowledge that it is important to be able to have that communication with your partner uh what is your opinion on sex toys do you think it is advisable um in my personal opinion uh it is you know when we talk about uh, sexual pleasure and a lot of and when i spoke about erotic experiences which you might want to enjoy with your own self and not necessarily with a partner um and also you know something some tryouts that you want want to do with your partner uh i would say it really depends on people because my opinion uh, on sex toys would be that these are products which have uh, which uh, which are out there in the market to help people either pleasure themselves uh or to or to make uh, you know uh, uh, their moments uh, much more interesting if it works for both the partners so i would look at it as just another you know sort of line of products which are out there um certainly uh, when we talk about um, uh, you know revolutionizing female pleasure i there are a lot of women who say that it's been great to uh, to have these uh, sex toys because i can own my pleasure there's so many things that you know uh, uh, that i can try out so i would say one i would look at it as a product line which can work for some which can not work for some and um, yeah i think as uh, uh, it it has certainly been empowering for a lot of women um, and i mean a lot of uh, boys would uh, enjoy it as well but it it really also helps break a uh, stigma around the fact that women shouldn't masturbate themselves or shouldn't find trap, um, you know um, pleasure with themselves so i think uh, they are a good product line i would say just in terms of in bringing more variety to uh, sex lives what is your opinion on girls who use birth control pills um i would say they are well informed if they are making those choices uh, knowing uh, uh, knowing well about when to use it how to use it um and also knowing that uh, what uh, an uninterrupted use of uh, birth control pills can do so uh my opinion is that as long as you're informed you know well you have spoken to a provider about it way to go uh do not just pop pills knowing that they're available over the counter everybody is different a lot of women and girls in india are anemic um and a, con a continued use of pills can lead to certain issues so it is important um that you speak to the provider uh what is the what are the chances of getting std if both the partners are virgin i didn't get that question I mean you can get an STD if you're a virgin or you're not a virgin it's really about how if you're engaging in a risky sexual behavior or not so uh, it's not really about virginity it's really about if you're practicing safe sex or not if you're not using uh, condoms you have higher chances of contracting any kind of STD and STI what's your opinion about watching porn for sex education is it really helpful uh, okay this is a good question because uh, how much porn is really available for sex education because most of the porn that is out there objectifies women um the act of sex that is shown out there is not real sex um the the way they would uh, the, they would present sexual organs are not normally what sexual organs look like there are a diversity of sexual you know uh, uh, there's a huge diversity when it comes to sexual organs and in real life what uh, nobody has perfect you know so most part people don't have perfect bodies that porn culture really tries to promote so i would say porn is great for sex education if it is 
produced in a certain way if it is if it is um, produced in a way that it, that actually tells people about real lives and real stories and what real sex looks like which is messy which is full uh, which is the fact that not every first time sex leads to or every time sex leads to orgasm um, you know there are things you enjoy there are things you don't enjoy so if that is much more real that will be real education porn in its present form for most part is not really something that i would i would say is helpful um and it clearly gives a lot of misinformation yes if someone says that i'm just watching it from the perspective of um giving myself pleasure and knowing this is all unreal it's different uh, but for most part i feel um porn is is something that does lead to a lot of misinformation and especially at a very young age uh how important does communication play a role when it comes to pleasure and satisfaction during intercourse and why isn't female pleasure discussed on large scale that's true i mean communication plays a very important role uh because unless you feel confident about communicating your needs what you like what you don't like like i said uh, it is important to be able to give pleasure but it is also important to be able to ask and accept pleasure so this can only happen if you feel there is communication between you and your partner where you feel confident about expressing your needs where you don't feel that you have to just do something to please your partner um and you feel loaded um uh, then uh, of course it's it's uh, you know uh, that's where i think you would start feeling anxious and that's where we we talking about a relationship perhaps not really being a good relationship because a good and a healthy sexual relationship also requires good communication um which will lead to you know understanding each other really well understanding each other's needs really well and ultimately pleasure uh why is female pleasure discussed not discussed is a very important uh, question and the fact that um let's go back in history and we know that traditionally women are seen as uh, subordinate beings um female sexual desires are all about fulfilling male sexual desires it's not it has never been about owning their own bodies owning their own selves um it is largely about pleasing the male partner and for reproduction so there is male uh, uh, female is a sort of sexually exists only for two things to have sex with men according to their will and second to uh, uh for reproduction so that's where the big problem and this is around the world uh, which is why it is important that we advocate for female pleasure that we um that we talk more and more about it that we make clitoris an important part of all biology books around the world and we all become very very strong advocates of um, uh, female pleasure um okay i think couple of other questions but i think we are running short in time so i will try to answer the three questions that are there quickly and then we can wrap up um ma'am in a society they have a notion about masturbation in male may lead to infertility uh, what do you think no masturbation uh, does not lead to any kind of infertility it does not lead to any any problem like a lot of people say think that they you want to turn blind nothing like that what is unhealthy is only when that's the only thing that you do the whole day right i mean uh if you're not able to take part in anything uh, if you're not able to do anything else in your life not take a shower not uh, you know attend your classes not do anything and you just want to masturbate 24 hours there sure is a problem uh but clearly it's not like you should only masturbate once a day or whatever it's not a problem it's a completely normal natural process and there is no problem with it and it does not lead to infertility uh what is the safe period to have sex in the menstrual cycle actually this is something where i feel i always say that there are actually no safe days according to me personally um uh, because what are what is being talked about as safe days essentially when you're ovulating um you know before and after periods and stuff is uh how sure are you i've seen a lot of people who have actually conceived during that period so i i always go with um with the fact that uh you're safest when you're using uh, you know any kind of contraception um otherwise it's really about you know what might work for you and you know uh, i mean a lot of people feel that withdrawal is very safe for them perhaps it is really really safe for them but can we say that this is 100% safe for all 100% people i i wouldn't be able to say that so um so i would say yeah the safest sex is when you are using contraception um and there is a safe period that is talked about but there is i would still say that is only 99.9% there's still a 1% chance and you're all medical students so you know there's always this 1% chance that you can uh, be pregnant 
um, again, with even with contraception, it's 99.99%. Uh, nobody can 100% say that, you know, it is not going to work otherwise. Um, I did not understand this question, but if it's that real, then it won't be enjoyable or pleasure. Uh, okay, so this question is linked to uh, porn. Uh, that's true. I mean, which is why uh, for most part, we as human beings have been, uh, I would say, have been cuter to see and visually experience certain things in a way which is perfect. What perfect bodies look like, what perfect um, sex looks like, what perfect vaginas look like, what perfect penises look like. Uh, but you need to understand that... Um, uh, who's 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 going after this? Uh, you know, sort of, or who's saying that this is not going to be enjoyable or pleasurable? Uh, this is not real. Un unfortunately, for most part, one is going to be disappointed in real life. You're going to make yourself as well as your partner or partners unhappy because you'll never be happy with something that is going to be real. Uh, if you know that you're watching porn just for the fact that this gives me pleasure, then it's different. But if you start having those expectations in your real life, it won't work. It won't work. Um, so yes, this was the last question that I've answered. Um, and I would uh, just like to, you know, close with uh, uh, certain things, just perhaps um, busting some sexual myths about good sex. So well, good sex is spontaneous. Not really good sex is something that you can learn. Um, good sex should end in an orgasm. Not always, you know, different people different things. Good sex can mean different things to different people. Good sex is the same uh, as intercourse, not really. You know, people, uh, there are different acts of sex and, uh, and all of that is, uh, you know, it, there's a whole variety which is out there. Um, and the fact that uh, when I'm talking about diversity, I would end with uh, Dr. Milton Diamond's quote that nature loves diversity, society hates it. So when we talk about sexual pleasure, when we talk about sexual identities, gender, it is important to understand that everything is natural. If it was unnatural, it wouldn't have been like that, right? Um, so what we feel are our personal understandings around sexual pleasure, all of that, um, we are, we are different people. We tend to think different about uh, the same thing, but it is important that the elements that I spoke about, self-determination, consent, privacy, safety, security, confidentiality, all of these are very, very important in context of sexual pleasure. Uh, and on that note, I would like to just end the session here and say a big thank you to all of you for taking part. Thank you so much, ma'am. So I just start with a quoting, uh, like a quote said by uh, Michelle Obama, communities and countries and ultimately the world are only as strong as the health of their women. It is with great pleasure that I now present the vote of thanks for this webinar's proceedings. Firstly, I'd like to thank our guest speaker, Ms. Vidika Yadav, who, despite their busy schedules, graced us this evening with an un, uh, like incredibly enlightening seminar. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining in. And it was, as usual, a very uh, good experience. I personally attended your web, uh, like workshop two times. Yeah, so this was my third time I'm attending it. Uh, I'll also like to extend heartfelt gratitude to all the co-organizers for the major contribution making this event possible. Last but not the least, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you for all of us to accompanying, to thank you for all this us to accompanying us tonight and making our event a success and we look forward to your continued support finally for those who like and this is a all a three uh, day going event this is just the first day wait for other two days too also we have on board shivani uh, our organizing partners founder clinic assistance founder shivani would you like to say something some words Firstly, thank you, um, Ritika, ma'am. It was amazing. The session was so enlightening. And Avantika had told me before that, Shwani, just attend the session. You'll understand how good she is at talking about these controversial topics. It's so difficult to have conversations on this topic. And today, I think so everyone, all the attendees, and even on the live, I think so everyone has experienced how safe conversations take place and how you can comfortably, not by offending anyone, not by you know um, upsetting anyone you can talk about these things yes definitely we'll take a group picture and uh, i'm i'm so glad that you could join us at 
such a short notice uh, vandika was a little skeptical whether like ma'am will come on board or no but we are so glad and this was a very successful start to our three day pandora fest um i hope that all our attendees will join us for other events as well we have lots of things planned for students against covid and clinicate both the platforms are doing well at the end there is the launch so that is why we are here this fest is for the booklet launch so please do attend the launch as well again thank you everyone for joining thank you avantika for moderating this workshop and for organizing this workshop i think so we can take a uh, i would request everyone to switch on the camera so that we can take a group picture avantika you will take the picture yeah 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 i'll take the picture i'm just waiting for everyone to Okay, please, guys, switch on your cameras. Everyone in the first uh, gallery, I think, so they have switched on. <clears throat> Can you see Avantika? I think so. Major like people, almost all of them have switched on. I'll just take a pic. Others are not switching. Come on, guys! We had such a beautiful workshop, beautiful session, talking to each other. I think so. We can just at the end, we can just smile and <laughs> contribute, like you know, show our presence that yes, we were here. We were a part of this beautiful conversation. Yes, make my day. <laughs> yes, sir. But the Kamam, she she spoke so much. She answered all your questions. I think so. She deserves this group picture. <laughs> she deserves everyone's smiling faces. <laughs> Okay, Avantika, you can go ahead and take a picture. Yeah, just done, guys. Thank you, thank you so much, Ms. Pam, for joining in. Thank you, much thank one you so much. Being here and looking forward to more such workshops with all of you. Definitely. Thank you so so much. Thank you everyone for joining. Bye bye. Bye bye. Good night everyone. And I've shared the feedback forms link in the chat. Please do fill up the feedback forms.